I'm glad that God is a God of second chances. Amen. I'm glad that God can pick up the broken pieces, put them back together. Well, boy. Brother Pope, you come. Can I just use this microphone or if I need to walk away, I can grab another one. I, I have tried from north to south, east to west to use those things. And, and I think my ears are just not adaptable to it because I will flip them off. It's only if I need it. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it does make you look kind of like a rock star, though. It, uh, and uh, country and western star. But, but, but uh, <laughs> or are you special people? Amen. Uh, by the way, that was a great sermon tonight by Brother David. I tell you, that was just right on. I've heard that text uh, preached from before. I think that's the best I've heard. I love his uh, preaching to the bones and then to the wind. It was great. Um, matter of fact, it made me want to preach on that too. There are two types of preachers that make me want to preach. Them that can, them that can't. Amen. And them that can made me were one. It was one that we heard tonight. One was, I didn't say that right, but anyway. I'm, I'm a little bit in a twirl right now because uh, this has been a really, really busy week. Uh, uh, we had great Sunday services at our church, and uh, uh, Brother David Gibbs was with us Sunday morning, Sunday night, had some great services over there. And then Monday morning early, I flew to uh, Colorado, then the British Columbia, and a group of churches came together there in Vancouver, and the Spirit of the Lord really worked. Uh, uh, there were preachers that were graduates from Bob Jones University and Pensacola Christian College and and other Christian uh, Crown, I think, other, co it was like an ecumenical fundamentalist movement up there. They, they didn't know about the wars that's going on below the line there, but uh, uh, had a great move of the Lord. Then we came back Wednesday night, and then we uh, had uh, and uh, uh, some great services at our church on Wednesday night, and uh, last, uh, when was it we preached in the Bahamas, Barbara? Was it this year or earlier this year? But a whole uh, basketball team from the Bahamas came out. Then we had representations from Southwinds Camp, Brother Herbster. They were all in our services last night. So we had a youth conference in our service last night. And we had late, late services. And uh, then we got up today. And then we came here. And I can't believe that we are now here in Corpus Christi. And I think it's been about... 18 years since I've preached here. Now, we support the homes every month, but it's been 18 years since I've been down here to preach, and, and uh, I am so full of melancholia right now, I can hardly handle it. Uh, tomorrow, I'm, I may speak on uh, something that, uh, if the Lord is willing, I, 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 in my introduction, I'm going to tell you about a letter I got from Brother Olof three weeks after he died. So you you got to be here to hear that now. I, the but, but that'll be the introduction uh, based on a message uh, that he wrote me three weeks after I died. I, I better let some of y'all know this. Miss Ida had, had uh, and boy, she just passed, I understand, too. God bless her heart. She had written it and said, Brother Roloff had uh, left this on the recorder and told me to have it typed up. So he wasn't able to come back to sign it. So I think he'd like for you to have this letter anyway. So that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow, the Lord willing, um, as God so leads. But Brother Betty Beckham, I share his uh, burden for prayer and for revival. And I'm so glad for the linkage that God's given him and Brother David. And good to see his daughter and his dear wife here tonight. And good to hear you all singing down there like you did. We were in a conference in South Carolina. And I had the privilege of sitting in front of them. And when everybody would sing, they would be singing harmony behind me. And it was just a, a wonderful stereophonic effect there. And I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord for the great uh, uh, Jubilee girls that were singing a while ago. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, now they look like the Rebecca Holmes to me. I think I've gotten older is what it is. Everybody looks so young. You know how it is when you're in high school, the, 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 the elementary kids look so young, and then you're in college and the junior high looks so young. Then you graduate in college and the high schoolers look like babies, and then the college kids look like babies. I'm, I'm here to tell you, grandparents don't look that old to me anymore. Matter of fact, I am one, so uh, 
Boy, and you're talking about a busy time. We had just gotten back from Missouri with my mother-in-law and father-in-law having a great Thanksgiving up there with some of our grandkids. And I did it all night. Or I hadn't done one of those in a long time. Drove from Houston after our services, midweek services last week, all the way up to Missouri. And uh, thank God Sean was with me. And we, we talked philosophy and Christianity all the way up there and back. Amen. But did you bring your Bibles tonight? All right, good. If you would, I'm going to have you turn to Second Samuel, the uh, if you don't mind, Second Samuel, the 21st chapter, and I want to begin reading in verse number 15. And I believe I'm going to read one verse and then have a word of prayer. Knowing that I'm the second speaker tonight, I've got right at a quarter till nine. Okay, is that right? One out now. now uh, uh, <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, it was only quarter to seven, amen, seven, eight, nine, is that right, quarter to eight? Yeah, quarter to seven, so it's not that late, is it? But but we're on central time zone, aren't we? Okay, but this is this is great. Thank you so much, singers from Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you for being here and singing for us. And uh, uh, Brother Calger, thank you so much for letting me stand in your pulpit. I got to love your pastor in South Carolina. That's the first time we got to spend some time together. And uh, we were on Bob Jones University campus. That guy got anything he wanted. I'm telling you, that guy is a mover and a shaker. Uh, I, he, he got us on a tour that I could not even, I, I caused him to miss our, our tour. Yeah, yeah, was, that's a, another story too. But I don't think we could have gotten a better tour because he just came up to people and said, you know, I've heard about where they made Sheffy. Come on, we'll show you where they did it. And I said, good gravy. And, uh, hey, what about the auditorium? Come on, we'll show you that. And I said, good night. All he has to do, he's got these puppy dog eyes or something, and he just gets his way. But I, I grew to love your pastor, and we, we drank some... Uh, uh, Boy, I just realized where I was. A caffeinated beverage, okay. <laughs> but he only drank one, amen. Brother Roll, please don't be mad. <laughs> and I drank it with him. Just as I... <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I'm scared. I didn't even drink any red soda water, amen. I remember, Brother Brother, Roll, I saw some of these girls. Their tongues were red. Boy, I remember that. <laughs> Boy, we had some great times together, and I and I and I ate what he ate and drank what he drank when I was with him. And uh, I remember, I, I remember, uh, and, and it was and it was an alcoholic either. I'll tell you that. But I remember one time he was having a really really bad headache, and he was just he said, "Brother Johnny, I'll be with you in a minute. I got this bad headache of L.A. saying need a little caffeine for that headache, a little Excedrin with the pop, sixty five milligrams, pull you right out." But I did. <laughs> okay, don't. Uh, <laughs> I got this funny feeling he's going to rise up right now and just say, stick your tongue out, let me see the color of your tongue, all right? All right, Second Samuel, all right. <laughs> well, you were prophesying over them bones. I was getting a little worried there, amen. We're blessed, it'd be fine with me, amen. Second Samuel 21, verse number 15. More of the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him, and he fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. Now that's our scripture we're going to leave you with tonight. We're going to pray, and I would like to say, and she doesn't want me to point her out, but I did come in with my wife. And one of the great things about our kids all being married off, the last one got, last of our four got married off in May. I have really enjoyed having her with me in the meetings. I'm, I'm, you'll see, I am a better behaved young man when she is with me. So I'm glad to have my wife, Barbara. And in the, on the 21st day of this month will be 35 years as my wife. And I have enjoyed uh, every one of those days um, for the most part, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how, how we should work, work that out. And, 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 and the days that I didn't enjoy were the days I was not with her. I got out of that one, did I? <laughs> Amen. But she has been a sweetheart. She, how many know that she's put up with a whole, whole lot more than I had to put up with? Amen. Yeah, well, you, David's about to speak in tongues down there. Easy boy. But uh, that is so true. Amen. God bless you, Brother Benny. Thanks for letting me be here. Brother Calger, thanks for letting me be here. David, enjoy the message. Singers, stringers, thank you so much for the... Is the stringers? Okay, the singer, the stringer singers, amen. Uh, sounds great, doesn't it? Amen. 
All right, well, let's pray, and we'll get right on with the message. Father, thank you for the time that we've had together. Give us the Holy Spirit power to preach. We thank you for the way that you ministered your life through Brother David tonight. We needed what he had to say. We were blessed. We pray for revival in our land. We pray for a prayer renewal in our land. Let us hear your voice and see your face and do thy will. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the passage of Scripture that we just read to you, you would not read these words when David was a young warrior, the poet laureate of inspiration. David waxed faint. Scholarship says that he was probably between 55 and 60-something years of age at this time. The old gray mare ain't what she used to be. We see David went to war with the Philistines and he waxed faint. What a scripture. Now, if I may use your imagination this evening, I want you to imagine what this is like. He learned in a very hard way that when kings go out to war, that you go out to war too. That got him in big time trouble one time. But he discovered that he couldn't fight harder, so he had to fight smarter, and he knew how to delegate. And so he led the troops into victory. And I can imagine him saying now, boys, finish the job here. I'm going in. Need to put these bones down a little bit. We'll see you for supper. And we'll talk over the strategy and the plans for the next battle with the Philistines. Your Majesty. Your Majesty, can, can, can we send an entourage with you? No, no, no. I, I parked my camel about two hills over. The battle's here. The bad guys are here. Don't you worry about me. I'll be okay. You just stay here and do what needs to be done. I'll see you tonight. Yes, King David. Yes, Your Majesty. They bid him farewell. And I imagine David turns about on his hills and he's beginning to walk down one of those green grassy slopes. And his mouth is beginning to water a little bit as he contemplates getting a hold of that Bethlehem spring water. I think after David's three mighty men put their lives in jeopardy to get him that Bethlehem well water, he was never without it again. You know how certain areas of the country, you go to certain areas of the country, they have their certain little bottled water. Like I know in Houston, we like that Ozarka stuff, you know. And over there in Florida, they like the Zephyr Hills water. And the rich people like the Evian or Fuji water. Yes. And uh, David liked his Bethlehem spring water. And I can just imagine him crossing that final hill and his knees buckle a little bit and says, Man, that, that used to not be like that. Well, you know you're getting older when you lean over to tie your shoes and you ask yourself, anything else I can do while I'm down there? <laughs> Talk to me, sweet mama. <laughs> Woo! Right in there. I'm kind of uncomfortable. I was tying my shoes tonight. I was going, ah. Did you hear me, Barbara? I was going, ah, pitiful. Of course, this thing's getting my way in the center. That's part of it, yeah. But, uh, uh, I can see David as he kind of gets excited and he goes up to the camel and grabs that cool animal skinned water and he begins to squirt that into his mouth. Man, it's running down on either side. Boy, how many like a drink right now? That sounds good, doesn't it? Whew. David's being refreshed and suddenly he hears a voice behind him. Use your imagination with me. He hears a voice behind him. David! He knows two things. This dude's got an attitude. <laughs> Number two, it's not one of my servants because it wasn't your majesty. It wasn't King David. It was David. Boy, he nearly drops that Bethlehem spring water. He wheels around and he looks. And there he stands. Verse number 16, and Ishbi Banab, which was of the sons of the giant. How many think you know who the giant is? 
Goliath. Sons of the giant. See, when the boys were reared up in Israel, they were reared up playing war. Did you ever do that, gentlemen, when you were younger? You play World War II? I'm Douglas MacArthur. I'm Dwight David Eisenhower. Or we play Civil War, you know. In my community, you were yelling, I'm Robert E. Lee or I'm Stonewall Jackson. We'd re recruit somebody to be Ulysses S. Grant or William Tecumseh Sherman, you know. Usually some Michigan boy would move down there and say, here, you be Grant. They were usually the sissies. Actually, they were from Wisconsin, okay? No, no, no. No, Michigan guys were tough. Wolverines. Go Wolverines. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Amen. Anyway, uh, <laughs> well, I am rooting for them. Amen. I drive a Chevy. <laughs> Heavy Chevy, but um, anyway, you guys, I married a Hoosier girl, so I, I know, you know, and I lived up in that area of the world for a while, yeah. People hear me talk and say, where'd that come from? I said, just take your pick. I was reared up here, born there. there, there. Anyway, but we'd play games and we'd do that. I can imagine those little boys growing up in Israel. I'm King David on guard. I'm King David. Where's the giant? They, you know, I, I don't know, talking about tying shoes, not me. i got to tie my shoes. I'll, I'll do it again next week. Now I need that thing around my mouth, don't you? Uh, let me pull a sock up while I'm at it. All right, I'll be fine. You, you know, you tie one, you want to tie the other, right? Okay. Anyway, so... I'm going to shoot here when it's untied. Anyway, but the boys of Philistia did not grow up wanting to be King David. They grew up wanting to kill King David. Vesting the champion. And Ishbi Benab is no different. He's the son of Goliath. And Ishbi Benab, <laughs> yeah, I like the sound effects. That's good over there. And Ishbi Benab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Holy moly. He's got a sword that's been sculptured to kill David. You know, I love to go through museums. We were just not long ago in the Museum of History there in New York City. And uh, we were looking at ancient medieval swords and ancient swords of the Greeks and the, and the Romans. And you had special swords designated for certain kind of fighting. This was a sword that was custom made with David's name on it. Ishbi Benab. He'd been stalking and walking, following, getting the king into an area where he's far, far away from all of his lieutenants and his troops. He got him by himself. Talking about between the devil and the deep blue sea, brother, here we are. There he stands with the sword. He's anything like his father. He's about 10 feet tall with an attitude. All of his life, he has grown up with a grudge against the man who killed his father. Let's go back a little bit to our story. Ah, David! Hello, my name is Ishbi Benar. You killed my father. Prepare to die. It's all in the scripture. There's even a six-fingered fella at the end of the story. I'm not joking you. I mean, the, the name Ishbi Benab sounds kind of awesome, doesn't it? Ishbi Benab. I mean, it sounds like some of our professional ball players. Kareem Aldujabar. <laughs> Shaquille Anil. Hakeem Olajuwon. And playing center for Felicia is Ishbi, Ishbi Benab, 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 Benab. Ishbi Benab. 
killed my father, prepared to die. It's looking bad for the home team. If you think that President George W. Bush is unpopular, may I remind you that President George Herbert Walker Bush before him was incredibly unpopular when he told Saddam Hussein that if you invade Kuwait, we're going to consider it an act of war. Furthermore, he told Saddam Hussein that if you invade Kuwait, we will consider it an act of war against the United States of America. And he invaded Kuwait and war was on. Brothers and sisters, George Herbert Walker Bush was bombarded. Bombarded. <laughs> this is a good mic. Yeah. Bombarded with incredible incendiary statements, inflammatory accusations, such as, you have started World War III. Even unbelieving, skeptical liberals were saying, you've started the Battle of Armageddon. Yeah. Liberal yeah. journalists were saying, you started the Battle of Armageddon. Every word George Herbert Walker Bush turned was a discouraging word. Until August 26, 1990, he lifted up that red phone in his Oval Office, and there he received a phone call from the best man in Britain. He lifted the phone at 11 o'clock p.m., August 26, 1990, true piece of history, and on the other end of the line, he heard these words. Good evening, Mr. President. This is Margaret Thatcher. Amen. The Iron Lady of Britain. Best man in Britain. Amen. I, I kind of like them feisty women, you know? Whether they're from England or Alaska, I like them, you know? Caitlin power, baby. Amen. But anyway. <laughs> and she had that kind of Michigan accent. But anyway. Um, this is Margaret Thatcher. And I've just called to tell you, sir, that I have at your disposal the Royal Army. I have for you, sir, the Royal Air Force. I have for you, sir, the Royal Navy. I have for you, sir, 7,500 desert train Marines. And I've just called to tell you this evening, sir, that this is no time to go wobbly. Those are her exact words. This is no time to go wobbly. Everybody say wobbly with me. Wobbly. You know, I wanted to get the feeling of what she was saying to President Bush, so I looked up wobbly in the Oxford English Dictionary, you know. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, here's what wobbly means. It means to vacillate from side to side. It means to shake and tremble like jelly. Let me, let me Americanize it with Merriam-Webster, like jello. This evening, with the Lord's help, believe it or not, I want to speak to you on this subject. This is no time to go wobbly. <laughs> Your Majesty, you're standing next to a 10-foot tall giant with an attitude, ready to cut your head off and stuff it down your neck. Yo, this is no time, King David, to go wobbly. In the day and hour that we live in today, this is no time to go wobbly. This is time to stand up and do something ridiculous like prophesy on bones or to the wind and expect the miracle. And expect, and that's what it's going to take at this hour for revival to come, for us to believe that God will answer prayer and to pray the price we're going to have to believe God against the odds. This is no time to go wobbly because number one, spiritual war is real. Just as real as the war that was going on between Philistia and Israel, the spiritual war that we are embattled in today is just as real, if not even more real. Matter of fact, there is a correlation between the physical wars and the spiritual world. Remember Elisha? 
He was full of, his servant was full of fear. And Elisha prayed that God would open up his eyes and let him see. And he saw the angels of the Lord fighting against the angels, the fallen angels of the devil. And he came to the realization that there's more with us than with them. That physically speaking, there was more with them. But spiritually speaking, there was more with us. In Daniel chapter 10, you discover that when Daniel prayed the price, He commissioned through prayer angels of the Lord. Why the warfare got so bad against the prince of Persia, which was a spiritual power in high places, that the angel of the Lord said he had to call in reinforcements from the cavalry. Lucifer, God's Jeb Stewart. Or rather, not Lucifer, but, oh boy, you know, uh, Michael, excuse me. Michael, the archangel, to fight against Lucifer's angels. So we had to... Understand that God was, and he said, I came from the first day you began to pray. Your first words were heard 21 days ago. I started moving in your direction. Somebody asked Paul Harvey of Paul Harvey's News and Comments, what's the biggest thing that's changed since 9-11? Here's what he said. There are no more civilians there are no more civilians as I was thinking when I was coming through the checkpoint coming out of British Columbia I mean I had to strip down to my belt and my my shoes and 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 I my my have my wife a little bit of lotion that was a little over 3.4 and boy they pulled it now hey Why do we go through these things? Because there are no more civilians anymore. We have people. As a matter of fact, last year there was a lady trying to get on a plane with a nine-month-old baby. And in the very carrying case that she was carrying the baby in that little, what do you call it, seat, that driver's seat type thing, was lined with explosives that would have exploded the plane, taking her and the baby with her. This is the day and age that we are living in. There are no more civilians. May I say to you, my friend, when you got saved, you moved out of the civilian life. God's word says, now thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. God's word says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual darkness and rulers in this, in this, you know, in the same way that we have privates and corporals and sergeants and second lieutenants, first lieutenants, captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels. Uh, we have brigadier generals. We have, we have uh, the, the regular major general and then lieutenant general and then general. And we don't have one right now. We used to have a five-star general of the army and then the president of the United States. We have a tier system. We have the, the devil and we have the angels beneath him and we have their uh, generals and their lieutenant colonels and their colonels. And we are wrestling against the spiritual darkness. And this war is real. David is between 55 and 60 years of age. You'd think he's already killed enough giants. Have you ever got to the point in God's work where you think, well, by now I'm bulletproof. By now I fought enough battles. Now I can retire. Now I can kick back. Everybody say this with me. New levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. As you grow in grace, the greater the battles will become. Matter of fact, my mama used to tell me, the more the Lord tries to bless, the harder the devil fights. I found that to be so true. When I am coming up against things that are bigger than I can imagine, I'm always able to smell sulfur, Brother Benny, that the Lord is up to something. Boy, when I, when I heard Brother Bobby couldn't come, or I heard, first of all, I think uh, Brother Capace couldn't come, I said, there he is. Then I heard Brother Bobby couldn't come, there he is. And for what it's worth, and, and, and I don't want you to, I don't want you to uh, um, um, uh, feel sorry for me because that, that, I, I feel great right now. But I want to tell you something, I had the worst headache of my life yesterday. I mean, I was thrown up before service and after the service, and I, and I got to thinking, I don't even know if I can get in that car to come down here today. But tonight I feel good. I'm glad to be here. 
I thought it was a headache last night. I'm glad to be anywhere, you know. <laughs> Caffeine just pulled me rough out of it anyway. <laughs> I'm only kidding. It was God, Brother Roloff. Amen, amen. And Vicodin. But, um, <laughs> but we give him the praise even through the conflict. Even through the conflict. When the devil fights the hardest, God's trying to bless the most. Nathan Bedford Force there, when someone asked him the key to his victory, he said, I get that a thustest with the mostest. When you have opposition, that's not the time to step back. That's the time to step up. This is no time to go wobbly because why? Spiritual war is real. This is no time to go wobbly because why? Number two, Satan always returns. Look at our scripture text of 2 Samuel 21, verse number 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. Look at verse number 18. And then it came to pass after this that there was again a battle. Verse 19. And there was again a battle. Verse number 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath. In Luke's gospel, chapter 4, and verse number 13, you see these words. It's when Jesus was tempted of the devil in the wilderness. In Luke's gospel, chapter 4, and verse number 13, when the devil had ended his temptation, he, that's Satan, departed from him, that's Jesus. Watch this. For a what? Season. The devil never gives up. He was on Jesus' heels until he bruised his heel. Little did he realize how his head was going to be so bruised. Now he knew the prophecy, but the devil never gives up even though he knows the prophecy. To show you how tenacious he is, look at the end time. When he is incarcerated for almost a thousand years during the Millennial golden reign of Christ. He's loosed again for a little season. First thing he does is get every unsafe person he can to get a battle up against Jesus. Yeah, I mean, you think he learned his lesson. There, there is no rehabilitating Satan. He just gets meaner and meaner. He hates like no one can hate. He fights like few can fight. See, this is no time to go wobbly because if you think he did not give up on Jesus and will not give up on Jesus and fighting him, do you think he's going to give up on you? Do you think he's down in hell saying, boy, did you hear David Harrison preach? Man, we don't have a chance against that guy. Did you hear Brother Benny pray? We don't have a chance against that guy. You think so? Satan always returns. That's true. Turns out the heat big time. Hell's with him everywhere. He never gives up. There are no longer any civilians. He's after you. I'll be real honest with you. I, I think that when I was a younger preacher, I think I was much more judgmental than I, than I am now. My tendency when I saw a preacher go bad or a servant of the Lord go bad, my knee-jerk response was, uh-huh, no fruit, no root. They went back because they weren't real to begin with. And in many cases, that is the case because they went out from us because they were not of us. They were like Judas Iscariot. Or some are like Simon Peter. They're fearful. In these moments of fear, they deny. I love that phrase of Scripture when Paul said to Timothy, if they believe not yet, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. God is greater than our unbelief at times. Lord, I believe, help them on unbelief. He's very compassionate. They may be like Demas. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Many get the Demas disease. Man, I've been preaching for 38 years. And my next preacher birthday in March will be 39 years I've been preaching. And I've lived long enough to know that I've spent the night praying with some of these guys. I've been in pulpits with them. I've been with them in private. I've slept in rooms with these guys, and I know that they're as real as real could be. Well, what happened? I'll tell you what, I happen, what happened more than ever. Have you ever heard this statement? 
How could brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so have fallen? Why, they were the best Christian I knew. That's not unusual. See, what happens when you get serious about serving the Lord, the devil puts a bullseye on you. See, if you're sitting here saying, well, yeah, well, I've never had the devil bother me like that. Maybe it's because you're no bother to him. Why should he rock the boat if you're on his side? I mean, if you're helping him out. And if you're mediocre in your Christian experience and carnal in your Christian life, you're helping him. You're convincing the lost world that Jesus ain't real. That what you have doesn't work. But when you really get on fire for the Lord and you become God intoxicated and you begin to get not drunk on old worldly wine but on the new wine of the Holy Ghost of God, man, I'm telling you, things begin to happen. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall receive power. As Brother David was talking about tonight, when you begin to have the breath of God coming through you and the people see that it's not you, it's Jesus, they believe. When they see us loving like Jesus loved, they believe. Giving like Jesus gave, they believe. The devil puts a bullseye on you. If he can't pull you down, he'll pull down your next linkus, your, your next weakest link. <laughs> Boy, you can tell I'm a little bit tired of the night. Um, he'll go after the spouse. I've seen that happen. He'll go after the kids. He'll go after the weakest link in the kids. The devil's a sly old fox. If I could, I'd put him in a box. Well, that's more than a kid's song to me. I like what Billy Sunday said. We ought to get the devil up in the corner and hit him. And hit him till our fists are worn away, but don't let him go. Hit him! Hit him till our arms are stubbed. Don't let him go. Kick him! Kick him till our feet are gone. When our feet are gone, kick him till our legs are stubs, but don't let him go. Bite him! Bite him till all your teeth are chipped off. And then when you're old and gray and fistless and footless and toothless, just gum him to death. Satan always returns. This is no time to go wobbly. This is no time to go wobbly because, number three, the devil is not impressed with our reputation. Can you imagine David turning around? Hello? My name is Ishpipanov. You killed my father. Better die. Uh, yeah? Well, I don't die easy, kid. You know who I am? I am David, y'all. King David. See this leather strap right here, buddy? See all those notches down that there leather strap? See the first one right there? That's your daddy. He's as ugly as you. He's big as you. And I did it once. And you stand real still so I can see you. I can do it again. Brother Benny, you ever been in a church and people say something like this? Boy, we had an old time Holy Ghost, heaven sent, heaven sent, heartfelt Holy Ghost revival back in 1939. Never had one like it before. Never had one like it since. Oh, we had an old fashioned Holy Ghost, heaven sent, heartfelt revival, 1973. Never had one like it before. Never had one like it since. As your faith is so beaten to you. Many times the good becomes the enemy of the best. It is good what God has done for us in the past, but God is not the God of just what happened yesterday. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't stop being God because you stopped believing. But Brother Pope, look how sinful the day is. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. That being the case, we have more opportunities to revival now than ever. But look how the devil's working. Yes, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask. And I like this, or think. I mean, we cannot even imagine how good God can be to us in a Holy Ghost revival if we would believe him for what little we can believe him. He'll do not as good as we imagine. He'll do better than we can imagine. Remember seeing a guy come down the aisle in Oklahoma City years ago, gave his heart to Christ, had been prayed for for 20 years. It was like a chain reaction. Other people got saved. 
God didn't just save him. He saved people they weren't even praying for. Boom, 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 boom. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The devil is not impressed with our reputation, what we used to be, where we used to be. Look with me, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 6. You know, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. And, you know, when you look at something here, I want you to see something. <clears throat> this is talking about the fire of God that God puts upon the altar of the tabernacle. God has often symbolized his presence by the fire. God spoke to Moses out of what kind of a bush? Burning bush. He bore witness to Elijah up on Mount Carmel. And when he answered by what? He answered by fire. You remember it was the pillar during the daytime that they saw smoking the effect of fire. And at night it was indeed what they thought. It was the pillar of fire by night. That was God's manifested presence when the Shekinah glory of God would go with that tabernacle and temple. There it would be the, the presence of the Lord symbolized by the fire and smoke on Sinai, the fire, the smoke. You remember on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came in power above each of their heads was a cloven tongue as of a wire. Fire. Sometimes when somebody gets right with God, we say, thank God he or she got on fire look at leviticus 6 and verse 13 the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar it shall never go out that's god's plan for the fire to never go out you, you want to see something that's rather re revelatory as to why fires go out look at verse number 11 and he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp into a clean place. Ashes were yesterday's wood. Ashes were yesterday's fuel. If you don't do the simple thing of get rid of the ashes, the fire on the altar will smother. I'm seeing Brother Brown back there. I was with somebody. It might have been one of y'all up in Arkansas. And did one of you guys live in a log cabin heated by the fire? Yeah. David, I've often thought about your cabin uh, that we stayed in. And, and I remember you showed me where it was like a big old Franklin stove. And you put, you put the wood in there. And, and uh, just you learn basic things. If you're going to heat a house by fire, you got to keep the fire going. And to keep the fire going, one of the simple things you have to do, am I right? Get rid of the ashes. Well, what if it's cold outside? It's going to get cold inside if you don't get rid of the ashes. But, but I don't feel like it. I know. I, I never, when I was tending our fireplace as a kid, I never asked, can I have the job of sweeping up the ashes? No, I wanted the job of stoking the fire, of getting it started. Yeah. Let me get it started. Let me get the kindling. A little pyromania in me. Yeah, let me get her going. Oh, no, no, no. Johnny, you carry the ashes out. You get nasty, you get it on. That's why they have to keep changing clothes. It's nasty work carrying out the ashes. Not only do we sometimes not carry the ashes, we want to frame them. We want to make a big thing of them. We're wondering, why is our fire going out? Because it's always Jesus yesterday. Look what God did for us yesterday. Look what God did for us in the 60s. Look what God did for us in the 70s. But he says, I want to do a new thing with you. That's what he was saying to Ezekiel. I want to do something new. I am the God of today. That's why when he gives a station identification to Moses, when he said, who am I going to say, send me? He said, I am. He was bigger than our past. He wants you to get past your past. You don't have to worry about the tomorrow. He's already in tomorrow. He's the eternal present God. I am that I am. Yeah, but I just don't believe God can ever do what he did here that back in 1900 and get over it. You cannot turn the clock back and do you want to turn the clock back? 
Why, there's more people going to hell now than ever. There's more opportunity now than ever to win people to Christ. There's more opportunity ever to get prayers answered. The devil is not impressed with our reputation. David is standing before Ish by Banav, and he's not going to be able to take out Ish by Banav just simply because he had an experience with his father a few years earlier. David could not even pretend that he was that young teenager again anymore. This is no time to go wobbly. Because he's not impressed with our reputation, there's no time to go in, in wobbly because he's not intim- intimidated. The devil's not intimidated by a religious routine. Boy, I remember so well being under the influence of Dr. Lee Robertson, huh? Now, listen to me. We need to go to church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Three to thrive, three to thrive. Just simply say, this is it. Straight down the line and never deviate. Straight down the line and never deviate. Three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Can you imagine David saying to Ish Babinov, Now, wait a minute, Mr. Giant. <laughs> I'm in synagogue worship every time the doors are open. I mean, I am there. Matter of fact, Matter of fact, I have written the top 10 for the last 10 years. You ever heard this one? The Lord is my light and become my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Psalm 27, number one, three weeks in a row. I wrote it. (laughs) Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I'll follow him. Hey. Psalm 23, number one, 10 weeks in a row, I wrote it. Yeah. Oh, Psalm 121? Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Matter of fact, I can play for you if you'd like to hear it sung. And Ishbab and Ab stands there and says, Oh, I'm under conviction right now. If you'll give me, if you'll give me an invitation, I'll get saved. Matter of fact, we better get beyond the routine. We better not only just know Psalm 27, we better live Psalm 27. Understand the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know what the Bible says? The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. One of the most dangerous churches in our community is not always the liberal church. It is the orthodox Bible-believing church that only believes it but doesn't practice it. They're operating in the letter but not the spirit of which the letter was written. And if you're operating in the sword of the spirit, you can cut in the community and make inroads for God. But if all you have is letter without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, then you're no longer doing the work of a shepherd with the sword of the spirit. You're doing the work of a butcher with a butcher knife. That's why many Orthodox churches cut to shred people and can't put them back together again because there's no fullness of the Holy Spirit in them. They begin to take the credit for what only God has done. The God who wrote the book, the God who gives the Spirit to power us to live a life that we cannot normally without Him. There's no time to go wobbly because Satan has his warriors in the wings. They are waiting to do us in. There stands Ishbibanov. Maybe David thinks, boy, I can't fight harder, so I got to fight smarter. I better get him the first big one. I imagine David quickly pulling a sword out. Why? And he throws it. As Ishbibanov blocks very quickly, and David thinks to himself, man, I haven't felt strength like that in years. Maybe never. Maybe David goes at it again. Why? It doesn't get anywhere. And maybe he thinks, I'll try my famous piercing effect. Whoo! And he goes like that. And I imagine Ishbibanov stands aside faster than any Mexican matador. And <laughs> as David comes by, he deflects him with the sword. And he can hear David breathing like a wild horse animal. And he thinks, uh-huh. He was already weak in the knees. Now he's out of breath. He, he, the old man can't take much more. And all of a sudden, Ishbibanov goes, Hooah! Boom! And David blocks as best he can, but not quite good enough. And all of a sudden, there's a red streak that's on his arm from where he slightly cut him. And like a pit bull terrier that's tasted first blood, Ishbibanov goes again. And David gets another red mark. And now 
First time maybe in a long time, maybe first time ever, David's backing up under a fight. Now he's up against the rock. And Ishbi Benab begins to think, shall I take him to pieces? Maybe I'll take up an arm. Maybe I'll take off a leg here. And I'll take him piece by piece by piece by piece. <laughs> I've got you now. <laughs> and suddenly there's a voice behind Ishbi Benab. Ah, this is no time to go wobbly because God is raising up other young people to do the work of God. There's a voice behind Ishbi Benab. Ishbi Benab! And he turns around and there stands Abishai. I was doing a little research. He was the best swordsman in all of Israel. The young man, Abishai. There he stands, probably five foot seven. Dynamite comes in small packages. Abishai says, you looking for me? You want some of this? Your Majesty, I, I, I followed you. I hope you didn't mind. I heard the commotion. Now here I am. You, you talking to me, giant? You want some of this? Imagine Ishbi and Benab saying, no, 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 Abishai. No, 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 no. I, I don't want any of that. I, I just want some of that right there. You're king. Oh, you mean Uncle David? Who? Yeah, Abishai was David's nephew. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah, I was looking bad on the visiting team. Yeah. Now Ishbi Benab knows if he gets to David, he's going to have to go through Abishai. Juan! Ishbi Benab goes like that and misses. Shoo! I can see Abishai moving, oh, floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there I see Abishai stands there. Command me, your majesty, command me! So what does David say? No, no, Abishai, back off, kid. I got him right where I want him. No, 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 no. David was dead meat. Stick a fork in him. He's done. No, David says, Get him, boy! And Abishai, I can see him. And now Ishbi Benav is backing up. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, oh. And if you'll let me borrow your imagination again, I can imagine David going back in his mind remembering when his brother came over for a visit and he hears down the long hallway of his palace. I'm King David! And he looks down the hall and there's Abishai with a little wooden sword. I'm God! I'll kill you, giants! I can imagine David saying to his brother, Hey, Bubba, he's from Texas. <laughs> Mind if I go visit with Abishai a little bit? No, nah, Dave, go ahead. Now you can see David as he leans over. Hey, Abishai. Yeah, Uncle David. Abishai, you, you want Uncle David to teach you how to use that sword? Would you, Uncle David, would you? David grabs a wooden sword. On guard, young man. And they begin to learn. And then he's an adolescent. He comes over and says, Uncle David, can I have some more lessons? And then he's a young squire. Then he's a young knight. And then he's the greatest swordsman in all of Israel. And David is watching him make the moves that he taught him. And I can imagine finally Abishai says, Hey, Uncle David, you remember this one? <laughs> Just like his uncle, a few years ahead of him, he's getting ahead in life. The Bible biographies aren't very long, but they are very concise and very understood. Verse 17, but Abishai, the son of Zeruah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Bada bing, bada boom. Molly was dead. Dead as the door now. He is dead. Abishai killed the big giant. Wow. I mean, I can almost hear a na 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 na, you know, in the background. B I C T O R Y, that's the Jewish battle cry. Uh huh. Huh. Ungawa, yeah. We got the power on a huh. Okay, but anyway. It's all in the Hebrew. You, you, got, you got to believe. You gotta believe they were excited, don't you know? 
I could just see David. Hey, buddy! You the man! You the man, Diego, San Diego, hocus pocus, try to choke us. Put him in a high chair. Who put in there? My pa, shit, come on. You the man, you the man, you the man. It's all right there if you can just believe, just see. This is no time to go wobbly. When I first saw Lance Armstrong, he was in his spandex, and I thought, riding these little tiny bicycle wheels, and I thought, looks kind of nice, you know. But then after six, and then finally he won seven Tour de France's, I thought, wow, I am impressed. 2,500 miles, 23 days, getting up to speeds of over 70 miles per hour on a, on a bicycle. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Texans. French hate Texans. Lady one time threw her, her pocketbook into the spokes and flipped them over at 69 miles per hour. One time, 126 frogs, I mean Frenchmen, got in the middle of the road to block him, and he's almost at 70 miles per hour. I had to go off the road and then back up to miss, and, and it could have killed him. Somebody asked Lance Armstrong, what's the secret of your victory? You know what he said? He said, I never ride alone. And if you ever see Lance Armstrong in any race, he's always got somebody nearby him racing with him. David needed Abishai at that hour. No man is an island. God could have delivered David with the same power that he gave him when he was a young man, a young teenager, but this was not God's plan now. The Bible says of David, interesting, Brother David Harrison, it says that he served David, his own generation, by the will of God. There's a natural fading that God brings into the life of a man of God or a woman of God to make way for the next generations. I think that perhaps MacArthur had it right when he said old soldiers never die, they just fade away. David was not ordained of God to kill Ishbibanab. It's now Abishai's turn to step up. When I look into an audience like this and I see some of your youthful faces, I almost feel like one of God's recruiting sergeants, Jesus wants you to step up and be what God wants you to be. Even a Lance Armstrong has to have somebody riding nearby to win a Tour de France. Even David has to have somebody nearby to kill off the giants that are coming when you're between 55 and 60-something years old. This is no time to go wobbly. One of my favorite stories, and I'll be closing with this, one of my favorite stories that I came across a couple of years ago, so precious. Charles Plummer was a fantastic, wonderful pilot. He was Eddie Rickenbacker of the Vietnam War. He had 75 wins beneath his belt when he was shot down on the 76th mission. He flew his missions off the USS Kitty Hawk in Vietnam. On the 76th mission, when he was on his sorte, he was shot down, his seat ejected, his parachute opened perfectly. He plummeted softly to the ground. A few days later, he was taken captive by the Viet Cong. He was in the infamous Hanoi Hilton for six years. Two of those six years, he was in a cubicle of three and a half by six feet. He was not even able to stand up for two years. But through that time, he said it was the faith of Jesus that carried him through all of those times in Vietnam. And he went and gave his testimony as soon as he was released all over the country. After 15 years of originally being shot down, he and his wife, Kathy, were in a distant state. They were at a restaurant and they were eating. You know how sometimes you can get the feeling somebody's looking at you? And he looked over there and he saw a man looking at him. And Kathy said, what's wrong, Charlie? He said, well, that guy keeps looking at me. I don't worry about it, Charlie. He went back to eat and he looked at He said, he's still looking at me. I don't worry about it, Charlie. He went back to eat and he looked over there and he, and he wasn't looking, he wasn't even in that chair anymore. Now the guy was standing right next to Charles Plummer. Plummer looked at him and, and the guy fired down these words, Plummer, right? He said, yeah. Charles, Charlie, yeah, Charles. You is a skinny hog, right? Right. 
and he named the number of missions. 75 successful missions a year, yes, Kitty Hawk. Right, right. 76 one year shot down, yes. And he gave him the date, he gave him the time that he was shot down. Right, right. And then the man smiled real big and saluted and said, I packed your shoot, sir. And then he smiled even bigger and said, I guess it worked. <laughs> True story. Charlie Plummer stood up and embraced him in the middle of that restaurant and said, every night for 15 years, I've gone to bed thanking God for the man that packed my shoot. They exchanged phone numbers and addresses. That night, Kathy went to sleep pretty fast, but Charlie just lay there. He could not, he could not get to sleep. He kept thinking about that man. And that young sailor tried to put a younger face on the man. Visualized him underneath a squared hat, but couldn't place him. The bib back, bell bottom, just couldn't place him. Thought about the times that he might have just quickly sent a salute back after he was saluted on deck. Thought about the nights that he went to bed in his officer's quarter while this young man stayed up all through the night in the bottom of a stinking, humid ship in the South Vietnamese seas, making one intricate, insignificant fold after another insignificant fold, doing an insignificant job until the night that he packed my chute, and that was a most significant job for me. He said, as I lay there, God began to speak to my heart and said, Hey, Charlie, remember who packed your chute? So you got to thinking about my mama who won me to Jesus. Now I got away from the Lord in high school. There was a Christian uh, high school coach that brought me back to the Lord. Packed my chute. I thought about people that have packed my chute. I think about my 88-year-old mother that's praying for me tonight as I preach. I've seen go, mama go 21 days at a time without putting a bit of solid food in her mouth, fasting and praying for her kids. Daddy had a doctor's degree in Bible language. His mama had a sixth grade education. Didn't know a lot of theology, but knew a whole lot of neology. She prayed the price, packed my shoe. Best friend I've ever had in life is sitting right back there for 35 years almost. Brother Ed, 35 years, four kids. And I've been doing exactly what I... My, my kind of week that I've had this week is not unusual, except that she didn't get to come with me. But never once in almost 35 years, never once did she ever say, I wish you wouldn't leave. Or why are you leaving me here with the kids? You're always going. Matter of fact, sometimes I get a call to meet and I say, boy, Barbara, I don't know. I'm, I'm just getting two books. She said, well, if the Lord gave it to you. You better take it. If the Lord gave it to you. You better take it. Don't worry about me and the kids. We'll be all right. We'll be praying for you tonight. The sweetest sound in my ear, I think, in my memory is when I would park my old 73 Volkswagen out the Houston Intercontinental Airport. And I'd fly in on a Wednesday, and I'd come in and try to get freshened up before the Wednesday night prayer meeting. And I'd pull in there, and usually around spring cleaning, Barbara would have the windows open. She'd have all the kids in, in slave labor. And, uh, and I'd hear her say, Daddy's home. Get out there. Daddy's home. Daddy's home. Made me look like a hero to my kids. Wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if she hadn't packed my shoes. Boy, today as I stand here before you, I'm asking you please to step up. You young Abishais and Abishaiettes, now is the time for all good men and women to come to the need of their country, their God, their church, their Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is now asking you to step up. Oh, to think that Abishai could be an aide-de-camp to David. But even greater, you can be the aide-de-camp to the Son of David, to the Son of Man, to the Son of God, to the Son of Righteousness who is risen with healing in His wings, who wants to be a boon and a blessing to Corpus Christi, to this community, to Texas. He's looking for those that are still standing ground, sword in hand, who have not wobbled. And this is no time to go wobbly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Sharper than any two-edged sword, we pray that you would now do your work in your will, in your way. We pray that these young Abishai and Abishaiettes will step up and be what you have called them to be, to do what you have called them to do. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Let your will be done. Oh, how we love you. We need to love you more. Speak to our hearts, Lord. 
Speak to our hearts. May the Davids not give up. And may the Abishai step up. In Jesus' name and for Christ's sake, amen. Let's everybody stand, please. One of the greatest...